Hey, and welcome to Words of Power. We're talking today about David, the worshiping warrior. This is part three and the last part of this study on David. I've truly enjoyed this. I love studying David. You can also take a look at the other people we've studied on my YouTube channel at, at Deidre Banks. We've looked at Hannah, we looked at Abraham and many others, Joseph to name a few. So take a look at those if that's going to bless you and learn more about the people in the Bible. There's a lot that we can glean from him. So we're going to jump right in today and we're going to take a look at some of the characteristics that David had or attributes that helped him to endure. And these things can help us as well in this life to be successful. So the first thing that we want to take a look at is David honored God and recognized that it was God helping him be successful. Amen. He reverenced God. He recognized that he could not do these things without God, right? He was a man after God's own heart. And so part of his success, part of his enduring was recognizing and thanking God. Let's take a look at this in scripture. After David defeated the Philistines, he honored the Lord by calling him by name. He calls him the breaker, right? We're going to see this in scripture. So 2 Samuel 5 and 20. So David went to Baal-perizim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water, right? God has broken through my enemies. God is the breaker. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Parisim. So Baal Parisim means Lord of the breakthroughs or the breaker, right? He's breaking through against our enemies. He's breaking through the obstacles that are coming against us. He's breaking through the darkness in our communities. He's breaking through the obstacle. He's breaking through the strife. He's breaking through the division in our communities, maybe in our families, maybe even in our churches. Amen. He is the breaker, right? And so we see that, and David is calling him as such. David is grateful. He honors God. How does honoring God help us to endure? Well, it reminds us of who he is. So I can continue to believe and stand on the word of God because I know who he is. When you honor someone, it causes you to remember who they are. When I honor God, I'm usually saying things about him, right? I'm praising, right? God, you are awesome. King of kings and Lord of lords. You are mighty in battle. You're victorious. I love you, Lord. Amen. You are good. You you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. You are a giver. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen. You supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. So I'm reminded of who he is. I'm honoring him by proclaiming who he is. And that reminds me so that I can continue to believe. Lord, I proclaim your goodness. I decree and declare that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You are the one and true living God. There is no other God before you. Amen. You built this earth, you are creator God, Elohim. And you speak to him and you honor him, you praise him and you're reminded of his goodness and how he is. And it's gonna be easier to endure by recognizing who he is in your life, by praising him, amen, and being grateful. The next thing we wanna talk about is that David had the Holy Spirit, amen. He had the Holy Spirit that helps us to endure. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He's a God. He's a comforter. Those are all the things that we need to endure. And there's other things the Holy Spirit does for us as well. Those are to name a few of them. But to comfort us, to give us wisdom, to also provide guidance and bring things to our memory, those all help us to endure to the end, to be saved and to endure to see the promises come to pass in our life. But let's take a look in scripture about how David had the Holy Spirit at a young age. David received the Holy Spirit when prophet Samuel anointed him to be king in place of Saul. This is 1 Samuel 16, 12 through 13. So he sent for him and had him brought in. This was prophet Samuel. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. That's referring to David. So Prophet Samuel had him sent in, and then the glowing with the health and had a fine appearance is referring to David. Then the Lord said, this is the Lord, rise and anoint him, this is the one. Because we know that they went through all of the brothers, right? They started with Eliab, the oldest brother, who was a fine looking man, but it wasn't him that was supposed to be the one who was in to be king. Amen. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, it says, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. 
Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Old Testament Holy Spirit was to come upon people at specific times and for a specific duration. We know that in the New Testament, Jesus went to be at the right hand of the Father and he sent us the Holy Spirit. We saw the evidence on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. So when we accept Christ as our Savior, we call that regeneration or our rebirth because we're born again. We are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Old things have passed away. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so at that moment, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes. Amen. But David had this Holy Spirit with him. So the Holy Spirit, we said he was a guide. He is a guide. He's a comforter. He leads us and guides us into all truth. Holy Spirit is also an advocate. And so Holy Spirit has so many things when we get filled up with that Holy Spirit. Hey man, there's nothing we can't do because with God, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, right? That's what Apostle Paul said in Philippians. So we know that David being full of that Holy Spirit could do mighty things for the Lord. And we see that he did. We want to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. Amen. The next thing that we want to talk about is David had advocates. David had advocates. And one advocate is Jesus, right? That's the one thing we think about. Jesus is our advocate and the Holy Spirit is our advocate. Which is the Holy but we see in scripture natural advocates that I want us to take a look at. Because one thing is we want to be advocating for others. As the Lord leads us, we need the grace of God upon us. But you might be an advocate for injustice. God may have called you to be a social justice reformer through prayer, social justice intercessor, social justice advocate that may be on your on your heart. God may have called you as an advocate, you know, saving souls. You're advocating for Christ. You're out there on the battle lines. We all should be advocates for Christ, right? We should all should be advocating and pleading the case of Jesus Christ. But you may have a special burden that God has called you. You may be an evangelist, uh, or you may have uh, some other strong burden, but not be called to be an evangelist, but a strong burden or a strong grace upon your life to evangelize. Amen? So let's take a look at this in scripture to see the advocates that advocated for David. And we also want to take a look at what is an advocate. Miriam Webster defines an advocate as one who defends or maintains a cause or proposal. One who defends or maintains a cause or proposal. And that's a great point because an advocate is not one and done. When you're advocating for something, you're strong, you're passionate. And so because it's their passion, they're not going to be one and done with that. They want to see that through with their true advocates. So you're maintaining the cause or proposal. Miriam Webster also defines an advocate as one who supports or promotes the interests of a cause or group. We can see this with social justice reform. People are advocating for a specific cause. They might be advocating for women's rights and they're promoting the cause of women, right? And they're supporting the interests of the women's group. Lastly, Miriam Webster defines an advocate as one who pleads the case of another. We see this in the court system. And this is often what we think about when we think about Jesus Christ because he pleads our case. He is a perfect sacrifice. So he's able to go before a righteous God and defend us. Those that have been saved, right? He's defending us, those that are covered in his righteousness, right? Because we receive that from him as a gift. And so we need to receive his righteousness for us, to, for him to do, because we can't go to those courts without Jesus Christ standing on our behalf, right? We need him to say, no, she's blessed. She's been born again. She has my righteousness. She's able to sit at the wedding feast in her garments of righteousness, her robe of righteousness, right? She's not sitting in her own clothes where she gets tossed out. Remember that parable of the wedding feast in the New Testament, right? So we want to be believers in Jesus Christ and he defends us. So advocate, we said a defender maintains the cause. Let's take a look at this in the Greek. An advocate in the Greek is parakletos, parakletos. And it means called to one's aid. An advocate intercessor, right? This is what we think again about Jesus. Jesus is ever making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. A counselor, comforter, helper, paraclete. So we think about Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's a counselor. He's a comforter. He's a helper, right? So we see how God, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, is the ultimate advocate. But again, we see throughout our natural lives that people are advocating as well. Properly, this is also part of the Greek, a legal advocate 
who makes the right judgment call because he's close enough to the situation, someone giving evidence that stands up in court. Now, in studying this, there's so much more that I want to share with you about Jesus and being our advocate and the Holy Spirit being our advocate. So there'll be a separate session, probably just be one part, where I do a lesson on Jesus, our advocate, because this really excited me when I was looking at this. And I want to share this with you, and I don't have time to do it all here because I want to stay focused on David. I want to try and keep us, you know, when I'm studying this stuff, I pull in so many different things and there's so many places that my uh, mind goes in studying and thinking about these things with the Lord and Holy Spirit leads me to, but I want to stay focused on David and the natural ones for us. But stay tuned, you will see a mini lesson, try just one, on Jesus, our advocate, and we'll take a look at this in more depth. All right. So how do we advocate for others? So think about ourselves, how do we advocate for someone else or someone advocating for us? So let's take a look at the, this in the context of David. People who advocated for David, what did they do? One of David's greatest advocates in the natural was Jonathan. I said that because again, God through the Holy Spirit is advocating for him. Well, we know God advocates for us as well, amen? So that's important for us to continue to remember. But we're gonna take a look at the natural advocates. So one of them is Saul's son, not Saul, right? Saul was the opposite of an advocate. He was an enemy to David. He hated David and wanted to see him killed. But Jonathan, Saul's son, loved David like a brother. And so he advocated for David. Let's see this in scripture. One of them is in 1 Samuel 19, two through three. And as we recall, an advocate protects, it promotes, and it supports our interests, right? An advocate protects, promotes, and supports our interests. So let's see this through the life of Jonathan and David. First Samuel 19, two through three. So Jonathan told David saying, my father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. We'll stop there. So the advocate is supporting David's interest in staying alive, in reaching his destiny. He's supposed to be the next king of Israel, right? So your advocate, for us, the Holy Spirit, or someone in the natural, is helping you. They're giving you prophetic intelligence or prophetic or intelligence in the natural. So Jonathan saw these things and knew these things with his natural eye, right? So he was able to see that his father sought to kill him. And so he gave him advice. Your advocate can also give you advice, right? Advising you on what to do. He said, stay in a secret place and hide to save his life. And I will go out and stand, this is Jonathan talking, beside my father, Saul, in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you, then what I observe, I will tell you, right? So he's going to tell him things that he knows in the natural. He's going to tell him these things and give him wisdom. We may also do this for our friends. We may see something in prayer or hear a plan in the natural and alert them. One of the things, you know, one of my greatest advocates that I have, you know, outside of my husband and our Heavenly Father, right, Holy Spirit, is my mom. She advocates for me. She promotes my cause. She supports me in prayer. She has dreams and visions. She also, you know, goes before the Lord. She may have a prophetic word to encourage me or a warning. Amen. She has advice. She gives wise counsel. She is an advocate for me. Amen. And so that's an example of an advocate who's sharing this information with you to help you. They're defending you. They're promoting your cause. And they are supporting you. Amen? So the great thing about Jonathan is that he did not just tell David what he knew. He advocated for him by defending him before his father as well. Not every advocate is going to be able to go before someone else to defend you. They may just support you privately. They may have the dream or vision and tell you directly, or they may defend you as well. That's another aspect of the advocate, but they don't have to do that. Typically they will, but they don't have to. So we can defend, right? The advocate didn't defend them by speaking well of them like Jonathan did. Let's see that in scripture. So another way they can defend you by speaking well of you like Jonathan did of David. Jonathan spoke well of him here. So Jonathan told David saying, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a place and hide, we saw that. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak with my father about you 
than what I reserve, what I will tell you, right? We read this earlier. But specifically, I will speak with my father about you. He was defending him before his father. If you read that later down in the chapter, he defended him. Amen. And so our advocate defends us. Our advocates also protect us. First Samuel 19, 11 through 13, Michael, who was one of David's wives, protected David. She told him her father saw his plans to kill him. So David escaped out the window, saving his life, right? Another way that we advocate for someone is to plead their case. Jonathan and David had a plan to see if Saul was in fact trying to kill David. And that's in 1 Samuel 20. So it was the feast of the new moon. That was a time to bring offerings before the Lord. And it happens at the beginning of the new month. As you recall, for the Hebrew calendar, it's lunar based, right? It's not like ours, 30, 31 days. It's based on the month, the moon. So it's a lunar calendar. And so at the new month, they'd have their new moon festival. So the first and second night, David did not attend this festival. So Jonathan, Saul's son, spoke to David's, spoke on David's behalf, rather, to Saul. And Saul was furious. So why are you defending this man who's going to take the kingdom from us? You don't know. And he speaks very vehemently to Jonathan. Then he throws a spear and tries to kill Th Jonathan. And Jonathan knows that Saul wants to kill David at that moment. He knew. He knew. 1 Samuel 20, 32 through 33. Jonathan says this. Why should he be put to death? He's defending him. What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Amen. So Jonathan is going to send word secretly to David. They had already discussed this plan where they were going to use this young lad with arrows. And so they knew certain signs with this young lad would mean that David was in danger. And other signs would mean that he wasn't. And we know that he was in danger of Saul wanting to kill him. Amen. So your advocate is going to defend you. They can defend you. And these are not, I want to say this very clearly. Because you might say, why is my advocate not doing all these things? You probably could say that. But the advocate doesn't have to do all these, but there's some of the things they'll do. Defend you, as we saw Jonathan defend David. Warn you, as we saw Jonathan, he warned him again. As Michael, too, warned him. They can give you intelligence of things that are coming ahead. Not just warning, but also good things that are coming, prophetic intelligence. They support you. They maintain your case, right? So these are things that the advocate can do for you. It's great to have an advocate. We need the advocate. Again, the greatest advocate is Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ is living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, who also advocates for us. I want to take a look at now the end of the story. So we saw David, he was advocated for, they helped him to endure, because they literally, these people stopped him from dying. So that helped him to endure. They supported his cause, they promoted him by speaking well of him, right? We also saw that he had the Holy Spirit, which helped him to endure. He honored God as well. So all of those things came together to help David get to the end of his story and also the end of, you know, becoming king, right? That was one of the promises over his life that he was going to become king. So after many years of war between the two houses of Saul and David and other tragic events, David is finally made king over all Israel in 2 Samuel 5. So the house of Saul became weaker and weaker, but David became stronger and stronger because God was with him, right? So David is finally made king over all Israel in 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5. We're going to read this. Then all the tribe of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years, right? So he was a young man when he got this anointing, this prophecy of being king. And he's 30 when it's fulfilled, right? And so he's reigned over Judah seven years and six months. He was first king over Judah, and then he was reigned over Israel. And, Ju and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So it was a process. Somebody say it's a process. We need to endure to the end to be saved. And during our journey of salvation, we're working on our salvation with fear and trembling. It's not done at regeneration. It's not done at rebirth. We walk out our salvation, right? 
There are many promises that are going forth within our lives. We need to endure to see those promises come to pass because they're not just for us, they're for our generations. David was promised that he would always have a man on the throne. Some of us know he needed to endure to get to the throne, to always have someone from his line on the throne. There's promises, God, that is given to you that affect your generations, your lineage. We want to endure to the end to see those promises come to pass. And we want to see salvation for ourselves and for our communities, for our friends, amen, our family members. We need to endure. And I want to read you 2 Samuel 5, 11 to 12. Then the king of Tyre sent messengers to David and a cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. It's powerful. He knew that God had fulfilled the word and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Right? It wasn't just for David, it was for his people Israel. We saw that with Joseph. Joseph didn't just make it, <clears throat> excuse me, to be second in command for Pharaoh for himself. He did that. God allowed him to do that rather for his whole entire family, for the whole entire nation, right? Many souls were saved because of the wisdom that God gave him to be able to interpret those dreams and the wisdom to lead. God is not just doing this for us, beloved. He is raising up a generation in and through you. You have power through the Holy Spirit to see these things through. And we want to rest in God's power. We want to rely on him. We want to get wisdom. We want to honor him. We want to do these things. Amen. God is with you. Continue to study with us as we explore the word of God together in words of power. You are blessed.